welcome to our clothes. once again we meet on this channel a channel of learning a channel of uh, studying the word of god where we come together as children of god and we share the living word of jesus christ i would want to urge somebody to subscribe like and share glory be to jesus christ as you do that be blessed uh today i am coming with yet another topic that we are going to be focusing on entitled breaking prisons of worry and i shall take a reading from the bible from the word of god from the book of matthew chapter 6 verse 31 to 34 and the bible reads therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for after all these things the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I am also going to give another scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2. And I'm going to read verse 11. And the Bible reads, then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. And here ends the reading of the word of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So we would want to look at this subject breaking prisons of war because this is one area which a lot of believers and a lot of other people are suffering from the issue of worrying and we are going to enter into trying to look at the causes of worry trying to look at what the word of god says about worry and how we can break prisons of worry because uh, worry like fear is also some prison that a lot of people are finding themselves uh, bound in. And we would want through the word of God somebody to be set free, somebody to be delivered, somebody to be uplifted because of this word that we are sharing. Glory be to Jesus Christ. So here, the Lord Jesus is speaking to us and he is talking about worry. And he says, we should not be worrying about things that we shall eat, things that we shall drink and things that we shall wear. So here he is talking about the basic needs. And in, if you find, if you look at it, honestly speaking, these are issues that really are worrying a lot of uh, people. A lot of people worry about these things. And here the word of God is reminding us that we should not be worrying about this. But because he says for all uh, these things, the Gentiles seek. So here Christ is trying to say, I am talking to you as, the, as my children. I am talking to you as those that are born again. I'm talking to you as those that follow Christ. And we are supposed to be different from the, the rest of the people that are still out there in the world. The people of the world are seeking for these things. And Christ is also saying, uh, we should also not be seeking for these things. So we, the different, there must be a difference between these two groups. A group of unbelievers and a group of the people that are saved. And the word of God is encouraging us as those that are saved that we must not be like the unbelievers. We must not find ourselves also worrying about these things. Let these things be the worries of the people that are not saved. The people that are still out there in the world. Why would Jesus Christ say this? Why would he say we as uh, the group that follows Christ that are born again are not supposed to worry about things that the other group is worrying about because it is because there is a key that he is giving unto us here there is a key that christ is giving unto us and i would want to emphasize on this one because if we miss the key then automatically we miss uh, the the blessing why we are supposed to be different from the other group why children of god are supposed uh, to be uh, finding themselves not in the same position of worrying about what we eat, what we drink, and what we put on, like what the Gentiles or the people of the world do. So there is a key that we find here in verse 33. So Jesus Christ is saying, only those that have this key should not find themselves ever worrying about these things. So he says, 
Therefore, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Before we come to 30, verse 33, I would want to talk about verse 32, because it ends by saying, For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Right, so which means here Christ is moving us from uh, the rest of the people so that we focus on something else. Instead of focusing on the things, we must remember that we belong to the kingdom of God. We must understand that the, the Lord our God that we worship, he knows that we need these things. So this is point number one. So before we begin to worry about these things, we must know that the God we serve already knows that these things we need them. Then we come to 33 now where he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what are we saying here? I think Jesus Christ is giving us some kind of a, or an equation. It's a, like a mathematical problem where he's saying this plus this is equal to this. Meaning that this is a mathematical spiritual solution that he is saying if we seek first, number one, we must first of all have the knowledge that God knows that we need these things, number one. Then number two, we get to the point of understanding that we belong to the kingdom of this God who knows that we need these things. So these are the keys that I'm actually giving you here. If you miss these keys, then you will find yourself as a child of God also rushing and running and panicking together with the, with the Gentiles or the unbelievers. The knowledge that God knows that we need these things, number one. The knowledge that we belong to the kingdom of this God is number two. And then the third thing now is we must seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. So what is Christ saying to us? How do we seek the kingdom? It means we need to be committed. We must put more of our commitment on the things of the spirit. We must establish our relationship with God. We must always remember that we put God first before all other things that could worry us. And then once we are able to get to that point, which is a point that I can honestly tell you that it is a problem for so many people that are even believers. Even believers, they struggle in this area of really being able to put Christ first, to put God first before we can think of any other thing. For example, when the sun, uh, when a new day uh, 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 arises, what is it? What first? What is it that comes into your mind first on every new day? What is it that you think about first when you wake up? Do you think about your programs first, or you think about God first? There are some people who don't even have a, a time to think about God when a new day begins. So these are some of those things. The things that are for the kingdom of God are things that we must focus on first. Let's put more of our focus. From our mind to our actions, our plans, we must always focus on the things that have to do with promoting our spiritual life. Then Jesus Christ is saying, only when we manage to do this, then all these things shall be added to you. So these things are just coming, they are just being added to somebody. Meaning that once we fulfill this mathematical problem of saying, knowledge of the existence of God, Knowledge that God is in the business of providing for us. He's God who provides, right? From there, we now follow the things of the Spirit. We make sure that we prioritize the things of the Spirit as being the first. Focusing on our spiritual life, focusing on our relationship with God. Once we do that, then these things will be added to us. Automatically, what it means to us is if we break this, mathematical problem, if we turn it around, if we do it the other way, then automatically we can't get the same result. So why are people today, or even believers today, failing to have God as their provider? It is because they are focusing on the wrong thing. The one that is supposed to be on the other side of the equal sign, knowledge of God, believing in, his, in, in Him, knowing that He's a provider, and the focusing on spiritual life and spiritual things, the things of the kingdom, equals provision of all these things that we need. So if we fail and then instead we jump the equal sign and we go to the other side, we now are focusing on the, on the product. We are now focusing on the byproduct. We are now focusing on the result. It means automatically now we can never have 
this uh, 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 equation fulfilled. This spiritual equation can never be fulfilled until we know how it works. So what is Jesus Christ trying to say to us here? He's saying to us, we must understand that everything that comes to our life is, it is not coming because of our own power, but it is coming because we have God who provides for us. If we understand that we have God as a provider, then we give God his time. We, now the world is so busy, even including children of God. They are so busy running after the things of the world. People are concentrating on making money. People are concentrating on their businesses. People are concentrating on how to solve their problems. And they, they set God aside. They forget about God. And by so doing now, we find that the problems and the challenges that we face as children of God, they overwhelm us. They overwhelm us. Because we are now focusing on, on a marathon that we are doing in a world that is led by the devil. The Bible tells us that the devil is the prince of this world. The, de the Bible tells us that the whole world has been swayed under the, 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 the hand of the, the, the evil one. Which means the world systems are run by the devil. And if we are going to join the people of the world and their systems that are run by their father, and yet we are children of God, of the kingdom on the other side, this is why we are being beaten in this game. This is why we are being beaten. And then once we are beaten in the game, we get frustrated. We get disappointed. People start to think that God is, is, does not want to provide. God is looking at our shortages. He's looking, is looking at, our, at our problems and challenges, but it looks like he doesn't care about it. Yet there are spiritual laws that have been laid. This is a spiritual law that has been laid already. So for those that understand and will follow and believe and have faith and continue to follow this spiritual law with faith. Remember, faith is the force, is the spiritual force, is the spiritual energy that causes spiritual laws to be fulfilled. So as long as we lose faith now in God and in God as a provider, in knowing that God cares about our needs. And then once we lose our faith in that area, we have taken away the energy from that spiritual law. Automatically, we cannot find, uh, we cannot uh, be able to experience the result. We cannot experience the product. So this is what Jesus Christ is talking about, children of God. I read here from the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is telling us of Solomon. Solomon here, he is talking about the labor Remember, Solomon was blessed. Solomon was very rich. Solomon was made wise by God. He became the richest man that has ever walked on the surface of the earth. And now, Solomon, after working so hard and he amassed all the wealth that anybody can ever think about. We may think of people that we think are rich today in the world, people that probably today are called billionaires. But I can tell you, all those billionaires combined, they can never have the wealth that Solomon had. But this same Solomon, is the man now who is looking at his works. I want to go back to this Ecclesiastes chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Then I looked on all the work that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was a vanity and grasping of the wind. How painful is this? Because somebody who is in worry today, who is worrying about what they will eat, what they will drink, and what they will wear, is thinking that maybe when they have all these, they will be very happy. They will be very satisfied in life. But look at this man. Look at Solomon who had almost literally everything that he needed. He had thousands and thousands of concubines, women that were just available for him. He had all the gold, he had all the silver, he had all the chariots, he had all the horses, he had vineyards, he had everything. He had laborers and workers. And here is that man who had literally everything that was in abundance and in overflow but look at how he is looking at his wealth and still he feels that he is not happy he says it is all vanity and grasping for the wind so I, I want to encourage somebody today that if you look at the provisions that may be running short in your life you might think that the moment you get those you will become happy you will never be happy the secret to happiness is actually focusing on the kingdom of God that equation that Jesus Christ gave is the solution. And we cannot argue with him because he is the giver of life. He is the one who created us. He is the one who created the world. He is the one who knows how to run our lives. So we can, if we argue with him, then we, have, we, we become fools. We, we become foolish. We actually have to go back to the author of life. 
And then we say to him, okay, how do we make it? How do we walk through this life? And then he brings us to that book, to that Matthew, uh, 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 verse 33. Then he says, For your solution is in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things that we are running after will be added unto us. So, people of God, I would want just to, as I'm concluding this message, just to show us the dangers of worrying. Because worrying, it does not just end at worrying. It has all its dangers that it brings to one's life. There are dangers that are associated with worry. When people operate or people live constantly in worry, there are things that happen to us which we may not know. So instead of somebody dwelling in worry, we now have been given a solution by the one who is the author of life. And let, me, let us go through a few of the examples that are the negative impacts of worrying over our lives. Number one, worry shows lack of faith. Whenever we are worried of uh, a, a situation, it is a sign that already we have lost faith. As long as we have faith, we have energy to be strong. We have en energy to know that we will come out of this. This will come to pass. One day this is going to be over. And the Lord is still with, it, with me, even if I am going through the fire. Even if I am going through the water, He is still with me. Even when I am in that furnace, there is still a, a, a fourth man who is going to be found in that fiery furnace. So once we have still have faith in God in times of trouble and pain and lack, then we will reduce worry. So faith is powerful in pulling down prisons of worry. Number two, uh, uh, worry also leads uh, to hopelessness. There are so many Christians today who are hopeless. There are so many children of God who are hopeless. You find somebody is just coming to the house of God, but they don't have hope. When they look into the future, they are not seeing any, any light at the end of the tunnel. They are not encouraged at all. Even when the word of God is preached, you find that somebody does not even stand up, does not even raise their hand, does not even uh, shout hallelujah, does not shout amen. They are just looking at you as a preacher. You can literally look at somebody and you see that even if I'm preaching the living word, that person is not even believing any atom of the word. So it's, it's hopelessness. We have people that are hopeless, that are filled in the houses of God today because of problems that they are facing. So hopelessness is a result of worry. We lose hope. And once you don't have hope for the future, then you are actually destroying the platform to your next level. You can never rise until you have hope because hope is a result that somebody has faith. And without faith, the Bible says, you can never please God. And if you don't please God, why would God reward us? Glory be to Jesus Christ. Let's move on. And worrying also, it causes us to mistrust God. Each time that we are worried by situations and we now enter into the prison of worry, it is a sign that we are, we, we are not very sure if God can really come out or come through for us and take us out of the situation. But as long as we can still trust God, we cannot worry to the level that, uh, that would show that indeed we mistrust God. The next point that I want to talk about over the, uh, uh, the uh, dangers of worry, worry also blocks miracles. It blocks miracles. Because when there is a miracle that is supposed to come to your life, when there is a door that that is supposed to, that has been opened in the spirit, that is waiting for the manifestation of time, that is waiting for the clash of Kronos and Kairos, it may not ma manifest if that, that time comes and it finds you in a deep prison of worry. The devil is able to snatch away any, any testimony, any fulfillment of prophecy, any miracle that is supposed to happen, whose time has arrived. If the person involved is, is found at that time in a deep prison of worry, the devil will be having more power over you because he knows that you are operating not in faith. And whenever you are not in faith, then you are down in terms of spiritual uh, 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 force to grasp things into your life. Right? It also leads to diseases. Worry leads to diseases. High blood pressure, depression, and things like that. Right? The next point, it leads to wrong decision. And every time that we worry, and we are worried, we quickly rush into decision making and we make decisions at times that are not proper. At times we are found to be, you know, compromising our faith just because we are worried about a certain situation 
to the point that now we sell our souls to the devil because now we don't know what to do. If anybody would come and would look like they are bringing a solution to our lives, we may find ourselves falling for it, which may not be very good for us at the end of the day. And the last point I want to make is worrying also it kills prayer life. It kills prayer life. When you are in a prison of worry, you will see it by also failing to pray. Even when you attempt to push yourself into prayer, you get there and you just find yourself that, you know, I don't even know what to say. I can't even op open my mouth to say anything. And so it leads to prayerlessness. And when we drift into prayerlessness, now we are giving an opportunity to the enemy to gain uh, spiritual ground. He gains ground each time that we are weak in terms of our prayerfulness. Because prayerfulness must be a continuous uh, process. Glory be to Jesus. So how do we break the prison of worry? How do we break the prison of worry? And I would want us to take a reading. And this scripture is going to be the one that uh, teaches us how we break the prisons of worry. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to read verse 16 up to verse 20. This is the secret to breaking the prison of worry. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 to 20. It reads, rejoice always. That's verse 16. That's the, that's the scripture. It just says that. Simple and straightforward. Rejoice always. Try to make yourself a joyous person. Try to encourage yourself in the Lord most of your times so that you find yourself always above the water. Don't allow little things, little situations to just pull you down as a child of God. Believe in the Lord your God and rejoice always. Number, verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. This one is a full teaching on its own, which I, I would, uh, by the grace of God, I may bring one day for us to discuss on this one. Pray without ceasing. How possible is it for us to pray without ceasing? Because people think that prayer is all about getting into your closet or into your room and you pray for whatever period of time, or is it an hour or less or whatever minutes, and then how can somebody pray without ceasing? But this one is a teaching that I would want to, I could simply tell you a hint of saying, prayer must continue in the heart. Prayer must also continue in our meditation. Glory be to Jesus Christ. So pray without ceasing. Let's not, let's not stop to pray. Let's continuously pray. And this causes the prisons of worry to be destroyed. Glory be to Jesus Christ. 18, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us learn to appreciate God. Let's thank God for every situation. I know it is very difficult for people to appreciate and to thank God when things are negative. But let's continue to worship God the same way we worship God when things are high, when things are up, when things are moving. Let's continue pressing and worshiping God the same way even when we are uh, down. When the table has been set before you, praise the Lord. When, the, when you are going through the valley of the shadow of death, Continue to praise the Lord because you know that he is still the shepherd God. He's leading me to green, greener pastures. He's leading me to a place that he knows that it is going to be a place of abundance. Hallelujah. So we want to continue. Verse 19, it says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. This is yet another teaching on its own that I can also come. How do people quench the Holy Spirit? But we are not supposed to go against our confessions must continue to be in line with the word of God, with the spirit of God. We must not quench the Holy Spirit. Glory be to Jesus. I have a lot that I, would, I may want to say on quenching the spirit, but because of time, I may not enter into it. Verse 20 says, do not despise prophecies. So when we have prophetic word that has been spoken over our lives, let us learn to continue confessing and believing God. Praying and declaring over every prophetic word that has been given over you. It continues to remind you that there is a plan of God. Because the prophecy is for the edification of the church. So one might be going through a dry season. And then a prophetic word is given that there is a door that the Lord is going to be opening in the beginning of the coming year. And we are going to, you are going to see your business rising. You are going to be opening more other offices or more other shops if you are running shops. And you see, even if you are in your in a hunger today, in, in a dry season today, you will not worry much because you will still understand that, okay, at least I know that there's a green pasture that is coming ahead of me. So you are edified. So that is the purpose of prophecy for the edification of the church. So don't despise prophecies. 
When prophecy is given, don't look down upon it. Don't think, ah, he's just saying for the sake of encouraging me. Don't say, ah, I don't think from the way I've suffered for so long, this will come to pass. It has nothing to do with what has happened in the past or what is happening currently to you today. Continue to believe every word that the Lord has, has, has dispersed to you. Don't despise prophecies. So, children of God, today we were talking about breaking the prisons of worry. Somebody that has been worried with a situation today, I pray for you that be delivered out of that worry. That prison of worry, may it be broken in the name of Jesus. May the chains of worry be broken in the name of Jesus. May you be set free from this spirit of worry. May the Lord continue to lift you and uplift you. May the spirit of the Lord continue to encourage you and read the word of God. Be prayerful and trust in the Lord your God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that are worrying you shall be added unto you. Glory be to Jesus Christ. I leave you in the peace of the Lord. Till we meet again in our next teaching. Shalom, shalom. God bless you, children of God, in Jesus' name.